You want to present yourself to the world in a manner that that doesn't disgrace you in some sense. That, that might be a good way to think about it. And you don't want to disgrace yourself because the consequence of disgrace is, is emotional dysregulation. More pain, less positive emotion. And so the best way to present yourself is to stand up forthrightly and to stretch out, you know, and to occupy some space. And to, to, to you, you make yourself sort of vulnerable by doing that because you open up the front of your body, right? But it's a sign of confidence. And that way people are most likely to give you the benefit of the doubt. And that's a good way to start regulating your mood. But not only does it directly regulate your mood to stand up, because it's so tightly associated, like posture flexion is associated with serotonin and emotional regulation, but also because if you straighten up and you present yourself in that manner, then other people are more likely to take you seriously. And that means they'll start treating you as if you're a number one lobster instead of a number 10 lobster. And that's another way that you can at least give yourself the bloody benefit of the doubt, right? And, 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 and confront the world in a courageous manner. Treat yourself like you're someone that you care about. You should figure out how you would like to be treated, like you were taking care of yourself, not how you would like people to respond to you. It's, it's more important than that. It's like imagine you had a child that you really cared for, and, and someone said, well, people will treat this child exactly like you want them to, but you have to figure out what that is. And so then you'd have to sit down for like a month and you'd think, okay, well, how do you want your child to be treated? You don't want everyone just to be nice to him, you know, you want people to challenge him and you want people to discipline him and you want people to tell him when he's wrong. It's like, you don't just want everyone to be nice. That's, that's pathetic, it's pathetic. There's, there's no challenge in that. And so, well, you want to treat other people like you would like to be treated. Well, then you have to figure out how would you like to be treated? And while you'd like people to fawn all over you and just lay everything at your feet, it's like, no, that's, that's not something you'd wish for for someone that you were taking care of. And then, then there's an additional problem, which is it's often the case that people will treat other people better than they treat themselves. If you have a dog and you take him to a vet and the vet gives you your pres the prescription medicine, you'll go buy the medicine and you will give it to the dog and you will do it properly. But if you go yourself to a doctor and you get a prescription there's one that there's a 30 percent chance you won't even pick up the medication and if you do there's a 50 percent chance that you won't administer it to yourself properly you'll do it for your dog so obviously you'll do it for something you care about and you're conscientious enough so you'll actually do it so like why wouldn't you do it for you your dog likes you you know even your dog would rather that you did but but you don't you don't and, and it's, it's actually one of the reasons that modern medicine doesn't work nearly as well as it could because people just don't take their medication. We're fragile and damageable and imperfect in multiple dimensions all the time. And that often just gets worse. It gets lots of things get worse as you get old, for example. So it's not necessarily that easy for a self-conscious being who's extraordinarily aware of his or her own fragility and, but not just fragility, um, Foolishness and errors, his, like you know yourself better than anyone else knows you. And you know, you, you might have a certain amount of uh, dislike for someone you know because of something they did, but you know everything you did. Jesus, that's a drag, man. You know, you have to carry that along behind. It's like, really, I did that, you know? And then, so there's that. It's like you're, you're weak and kind of useless and prone to temptation. And you know all those things, you know, that just shouldn't be that way. And then you're also capable of pretty vicious acts of malevolence. And so you also know that about yourself. And so it's a real existential question for people. It's like, why the hell should you take care of something as sorry and wretched as you are? First of all, yes, you're pretty useless and terrible, but so is everyone else. And that's actually an existential problem, right? And what I mean by that, it's a problem that every human being has always had and always will. So it's not just you, it's a universal problem. And that there's, there's an answer to that. And one of them is to, uh, what is it to say? Love the sinner but hate the sin. It's something like that. Is that despite the fact that you're not all that you could be, the proper attitude to have towards yourself is the attitude that you would have towards someone that you genuinely cared for. And that it's incumbent on you to act as if you genuinely care for yourself. Just like you would act towards someone that you actually cared about, some other person. And so it's a reversal in some sense of the golden rule, right? And, and it's a discussion of why that's necessary. And also more than that, it's a discussion of why, why you have a moral obligation to do that. 
It's, it's not just that you should because it would be better for you. It's, you actually have a moral obligation to do that, I think, because you make the world a much better place, much worse place if you don't take care of yourself. So you should bloody well take care of yourself. You know, It's partly because you have something valuable to bring into the world. That's the thing about being an individual. It's the thing that Western civilization has always recognized that as an individual, you have a light that you have to bring into the world. And that if you don't bring it into the world, the world is a dimmer place. And that's a bad thing because when the world is a dim place, it can get very, very, very dark. And so it's necessary, not just so that you feel better, not just so that you're a number one lobster, none, none of those things. You need to take care of yourself because you're in the best position to do that. And it's necessary for you to take care of yourself. Despite the fact that we're mortal and vulnerable and self-conscious and capable, not only capable of doing terrible things, but actually do them. Despite all that, you, you're still, you still have that responsibility. And so I wanted to, you know, hit the question as hard as I can to try to figure out, well, why people are, have, are contemptuous of themselves. And there's plenty of reason, that's for sure. But the reasons do not justify the mistreatment of yourself. It's as simple as that. It's not a good strategy. I had friends who wanted the best for me and friends who didn't. And, you know, they were friends who, some of them were aiming up and some of them were aiming down. And if you have a friend that's aiming down and you do something that's aiming up, then they're generally not that happy about it, you know. They try to top your accomplishment with one of their own hypothetical or real or put down what you're doing or offer you a cigarette if you're trying to quit and you've kind of done that successfully or a drink if you've been drinking too much and are just trying to stop being an alcoholic, you know. Or, or yeah, they're cynical and bitter and, and devoted towards no good and sometimes that's family members too and sometimes it's even part of you, you know. Like you have an ethical responsibility to take care of yourself, you have an ethical responsibility to surround yourself with people who have the courage and, and faith and wisdom to wish you well when you've done something good and to stop you when you're doing something destructive. And if your friends aren't like that, then they're not your friends. And maintaining your friendships with them might not even be in their interest. A friend is someone you can share good news with, you know. You go to them and you say, hey, look, this good thing happened to me. And, and they say, look, I'm so happy that that happened to you. Like, way to be. And they don't think, God damn it, why didn't that happen to me? And like, you know, you didn't deserve it. Here's a bunch of reasons you're stupid and why it won't work. It's like, that's not helpful. And so I would say, like, if people are, you know what, the other thing people are doing, if they're trying to drag you down, let's say, is they're trying to see if you'll put up with it. Because they have this idea that maybe life isn't worth living and things aren't good and that if they can be smirched, let's say, to use an archaic term, something that's pristine and good, then they demonstrate to themselves that there is no true ideal and that there's no necessary reason to be responsible and to strive forward. And so they use you as a test case, you know, I'll just push you down into the low lobster bin and see how you respond. And if you put up with it, then yeah, my cynicism is fully justified. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday not to who someone else is today. See, I'd been taught <clears throat> as a psychologist that most human characteristics were normally distributed, right? So most people were average and some people were extreme. That, that's a pre or a normal distribution. Intelligence is like that and height. There's more people of average height than, than very tall or very short. And, and weight is like that. And lots of things are normally distributed and psychologists tend to assume that everything is, but it isn't. Creative products are distributed in a Pareto distribution, and that's a whole different thing. And it's really important to know this. It's another fundamental fact, the knowledge of which can sort of transform the way you conceptualize, let's say, the political landscape. So here, here's an example of the Pareto distribution. Uh, you know, there's a rule of thumb that if you run a company that 20% of your employees do 80% of the work, or that 20% of your customers are responsible for 80% of your sales, or the 20% of them are responsible for 80% of the customer service calls. Same thing, but that's not exactly the rule. The rule is worse than that. The rule is, in a given domain, the square root of the number of people operating in that domain do half the productive work. So you think, well, you have 10 employees, three of them do half the work. It's like, yeah, okay. What if you have 100 employees? Then 10 of them do half the work. What if you have 1,000 employees? Well, then it's 30. And if it's 10,000 employees, then it's 100. And this actually turns out to be a rather ironclad rule. It, it, it applies across very, very many situations. It, it applies, for example, to the mass of stars and the size of cities. 
So you can see how universal it is as a law. And it's, it's something like those that have more get more and those that have less get less. That's the Matthew principle, right? To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken away. It's no, no matter what society you study, you get a Pareto distribution of wealth. You get a Pareto distribution of number of records recorded. You get a Pareto distribution of number of songs written or goals scored. Like any creative product has that characteristic. And it's partly because as you start to become successful, let's say, people offer you more and more opportunities. And as you start to fail, people move away from you and you plummet. There is inequality. What that means is there's always going to be people around that are better at something than you are. And, the, and that's, a, that's a problem because you can get jealous and you can get bitter and you can get resentful. And worse, you can get hopeless. You have to be careful who you compare yourself to. Now, you can't just not compare yourself to others, to successful people, right? Because then you don't have anything to aim at. You need an ideal because you have nothing to aim at, but an ideal is a judge. And you always fall short of the ideal. So how the hell can you have the benefits of having an ideal without having the crushing blow that goes along with having the judge that always regards you as insufficient? You need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So you got to set up a goal and then you got to make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, bit of practical, I wouldn't say advice, it's, it's because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is and then make the next step difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. It's also what you do with children, right? You, you want to push them because they need to grow up and be more than they are, right? But you don't want to crush them with constant failure. So what you do is aim high and make the goal difficult but proximate. You really have to stop comparing yourself in some ways to other people. And the reason for that is that the particularities of your life are so idiosyncratic that there isn't anyone really all that much like you, you know, because the details of your life happen to matter. And so maybe you compare yourself to some rock star or something like that, and you know, the person's rich and famous and glamorous and all that, but you know, they're alcoholic and they use too much cocaine and they've had three divorces, and it's like, how the hell do you make sense out of that? Is that someone that you should judge yourself harshly against or not? The answer is you don't know, because you don't know all the details of their lives. And who do you know that you can compare yourself to? That's easy. You. Yesterday. Aim high, but use as your control yourself. It's like, so your goal is to make today some tiny increment better than yesterday. And you can use better, you can define better yourself. This doesn't have to be some imposition of external morality. You know, you know where you're weak and insufficient, where you could improve. Think, okay, well, this is what I'm like yesterday. If I did this little thing, things would be just a, an increment better. And well, that's a great thing because you get the ball rolling and incremental improvement is unstoppable. You can actually implement it and it starts to generate Pareto distribution-like consequences. It starts to compound. And I how, how do I manage all this misery and suffering and futility? It's like, well, I need to figure out what I would have to do in order to make that clearly worthwhile. And so then you have your goal and then you think, well, I need to move towards that incrementally because I'm kind of useless and can only do so much and maybe not even that. And, but all I have to do is be a little bit better than my, my miserable self yesterday. And that'll propel you forward very rapidly and, and you can succeed at it, which is also really lovely because why not set yourself up for success? He who has a why can bear almost any how. Please don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell for future notifications, like, comment and share it with a friend.